Hello and thanks for watching. Hope you're continuing to enjoy this series from Open Door Church Sunbury and finding it helpful. We've got some great contributors uh, and I presume you're still enjoying it or you wouldn't be watching. So thank you for your support. Uh, in my last three videos we looked at Genesis chapters 1, 2 and 3 and today we're looking at Genesis chapter 4, The Murder in the Field. Sounds like something out of Agatha Christie or something, doesn't it? My wife and I quite like watching Death in Paradise. I don't know if you've seen that one, trying to figure out who done it. Well, in this case, there's no question about who done it. We, we're told from the very start. The story goes that Adam and Eve had two sons. One was Abel, the other was Unabel. Yes, laugh for you've still got the chance. Uh, but no, his name was Cain. Mm -hmm. Not that sort. Oops. Anyway, that's who they were. The two contenders are Abel and Cain. And so let's just read from Genesis chapter 4. Here's the story. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. <clears throat> Terrible story, really. The first murder in the Bible. We're not told exactly why Cain's offering was rejected. It wasn't the nature of it. Grain offerings and first fruits of the ground became an important element of Jewish worship in later days. And were perfectly acceptable. But what we're told is the Lord looked with favour on Abel. And his offering, but not on Cain and his. So it was not so much about the offering, but it was about the man first and foremost. And what became clear as the story goes on is that Cain comes with a bad attitude. There must have been already bad blood between the two brothers. You don't go from peace and harmony and brotherly love one moment to murder based on a single event like this. There was clearly envy and anger and jealousy and all kinds of things in the mix of the relationship. It reminds me maybe of something Jesus taught when he said, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. And I wonder if there was something of that going on that Cain had something in his heart against his brother when he brought that offering and that made him and his offering unacceptable. And we can see Cain's bad attitude in his response, not in remorse, not with a teachable attitude, wanting to learn how he can please God, but with anger and jealousy. And anger and jealousy that's directed not at God, but at his brother, which makes no sense. It's not Abel's fault that Cain was rejected. But he lures Abel the way and kills him in the field where he can do it secretly, where there's nobody else to help. So we see three things, I think, in this story. Firstly, bad attitude leads to bad behaviour. James chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Just as good attitude leads to good behaviour, so bad attitude leads to bad. Stephen Covey in his book The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People said this, sow a thought, reap an action, sow an action, reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. <clears throat> and it's so true, what we think is what we become. What we fill our minds with comes out in how we behave. We can't control the things that happen to us, but we can control how we respond to them and the attitude with which we approach them. 
And then we see that bad attitude has consequences. Cain effectively loses his life. It's not just Abel who loses his life, but Cain loses the life that he had, the fruitfulness, um, the, the opportunity to engage with God and, and be friends, if you like. And sadly, today there is a man dead and there's an ex-police officer in jail in Minnesota who's lost everything, lost his job, his career, his marriage, his reputation, his freedom, all because of a bad attitude, a racist attitude, which also led to murder. Bad attitude leads to consequences. Kenneth E. Bailey says you can pig out on righteousness with no side effects. I think that's great. Pig out on righteousness, but bad attitude has consequences. In the last chapter, we saw how Eve's desire for the fruit led her into bad behaviour. Here, there's another desire. Sin desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Just as we were given rule over the earth, so we must also rule over our inner lives. We are of the earth, therefore our desires are of the earth, therefore we must master them. In Christ, there's always forgiveness when we sin, provided we confess and turn away from it. But there will always be consequences. And then thirdly, we learn that bad attitude spreads. Bad attitude is catching. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad attitude is like a virus. People don't so much learn from what we say and what we tell them as copy what we are. Someone once said, what you are shouts so loudly in my ear that I cannot hear what you say. I'm sure we can all think of examples and times when we've been badly influenced. I know I can, thinking back to my school days and things that I said and did that I'm ashamed of. It was partly because I was influenced by kids around me. People we know perhaps who've been led astray because they fell into bad company. And even towards the end of this chapter, we, we find out something about the great, great, great grandson, Lamech, who said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. So even five generations later, what Cain did is still remembered and copied. Also, incidentally, we see the emergence of a vendetta culture. Lamech is avenged. And that can be quite important to remember and bear in mind when we're reading and interpreting some of the other events and teachings of the scripture is the cultural background that it was written in. Another way to look at it is this, that Adam and Eve were led astray by that old spiritual enemy, Satan, represented by the snake. Cain was led astray by internal things, his thoughts, his feelings, his attitude. Lamech was led astray by something that was happening in his world, in, in, in his case the folk memory of what his great-great-great-grandfather Cain did. And so in these two chapters we see the three enemies of righteousness that we find described in the New Testament, the world, the flesh and the devil, all enacting to bring about bad behaviour, to bring about sin and its consequences. Bad attitude leads to bad behaviour. Bad attitude has consequences both for us and for others. Bad attitude spreads. So can I just suggest you it's good practice from time to time to ask God about your attitude. If somebody says to you, you've got a bad attitude, consider it possible that they may be right. We don't have to be feel condemned over every unrighteous and wrong accusation, but let's at least consider it possible that a criticism may be correct and we need to hear it and correct our attitude. <clears throat> So, our Father, thank you for this lesson that you've given us that is so apt and so appropriate for us today. And, Father, help us to guard our attitude, to be aware of when our attitude is bad, to not make excuses, not try to cover it up, not pretend that it's OK, but to deal with it, to bring it before you and to seek healing, to repent and turn and be cleansed. Amen.